Yeah, my chest pain started um, acutely and also cardiac ischemia patients have very acute onset of chest pain of course so it's usually a few hours uh, or maximum a couple of days so it's not like weeks and weeks and the PE patients also usually have a few days or a few hours chest pain and but this is going to be a relatively young patient usually but it can also be older patients um, so the pain is going to be pleuritic chest pain so this is going to be worse with deep inspiration so patient will take a deep breath in and that's when the chest pain gets really worse uh, in addition they may say that they have palpitations uh, this usually happens if they have developed tachycardia because of the PE and that's how they feel palpitations they can also have low grade fever although it's not always present but if it is present uh, you may think that it is uh, because of PE however if the fever is high grade then definitely think about other causes of dyspnea and chest pain um, or think that something else another infection is going on with PE so uh, this if present should be low grade in PE uh, on top of that these patients typically have leg pain or swelling of leg and usually it's unilateral so if you're suspecting PE because of typical pleuritic chest pain with shortness of breath uh, of acute duration uh, we should ask about leg pain and swelling now the patient may look at you with surprise asking why are you looking at my leg and I'm talking to you about my chest pain and shortness of breath but the reason behind this would be because most blood clots that go to the lungs come from the leg so these patients also this is an important thing to keep in mind have no symptoms at all if they're uh, if the PE is very small and uh, peripheral or uh, or the it is just so small that it's not involving any pleura or too much parenchyma so they just don't develop any chest pain because the mechanism of chest pain is due to invo involvement of pleura and mechanism of shortness of breath is due to involvement of parenchyma so if the PE is very small and it's not close to the pleura then they are not going to have any symptoms at all and when would you suspect it, uh, suspect this uh, situation uh, so in addition to uh, finding that the patient has typical chest pain with shortness of breath these risk factors may be present so these are highly important risk factors that we should keep in mind so your patient um, so I'll start here so patient who had a recent surgery so this again it is usually a recent surgery very very recent it's not like one year or two year old surgery recent surgery uh, period of immobilization and or because of surgery they had a period of immobilization because of travel or anything like that or they just had a trauma or they have a malignancy uh, because the malignancy is a hypercoagulable state generally speaking it um, stimulates a lot of proteins and cascade of reactions so that's how it becomes hypercoagulable state so whenever you have any of these present surgery immobilization trauma travel or malignancy you must keep pulmonary embolism high on your radar um, so that's why it's important to uh, either look for these uh, in the past medical history or ask the patient directly when you are asking them about the uh, questions about uh, their problems uh, in addition to that a patient with a history of smoking if they've been using birth control pills also uh, can uh, be uh, placed at risk for uh, DVT or PE and then there are some hereditary things for example protein C and S deficiency or antithrombin 3 deficiency so patients who have these deficiencies or factor 5 Leiden mutations so these things are hereditary unfortunate situations where patients may not have any risk factors and they may actually be just very normal but because of this family history now they can develop a DVT and PE and so these are going to be your what we call as uh, unprovoked DVTs or unprovoked PEs uh, they, these patients have not done anything to themselves but they just by luck uh, they uh, develop the DVT so whenever they develop a DVD, they have to be on lifelong anticoagulation because you cannot uh, anticipate uh, when or when not they're going to develop it again. Uh, and then there is this virtuous triad that people talk about uh, and you get asked about in your exams quite a bit. Um, practically speaking, this is just all of these things that constitute virtuous triad. So it's basically any hypercoagulability, inflammation or stasis. So it's HIV, so it's not the HIV infection. So remember the HIV stands for hypercoagulability, which many of these conditions are, inflammation, which some of these are, and then venous stasis because of immobilization. So any of these will, uh, or this triad will give rise to uh, propensity for DVT, ultimately causing PE. 
so uh, what are the physical exam findings or signs in these patients so they have tachycardia tachypnea and then low oxygen saturation if this is present then it's a pretty uh, big red flag and you must uh, take it very seriously but it's not always present and then on a lung exam you may hear some crackles uh, usually they're very uh, diffuse scattered crackles uh, and usually on that side where the PE is present um, and then these patients like I said may have low grade fever but usually it's not present and home end sign is the uh, sign where uh, when you dorsiflex uh, the patient's uh, foot uh, uh, and they may they have pain in their posterior uh, calf or leg and that's how you say okay it is a positive home end sign and it's a positive sign for DVT therefore this patient may have PE uh, because now they have shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain so what are the tests uh, that we order whenever we are suspecting uh, PE in the setting of these symptoms and signs and risk factors uh, well EKG would be the first thing to do of course because you have chest pain and then uh, this may show some STT changes but the most common EKG finding is normal sinus tachycardia and then D-dimer uh, will be elevated. Now this is a very highly sensitive uh, test, which means that if D-dimer is, uh, is low or normal, then you can uh, rule out PE. A patient with PE will definitely have a high D-dimer, but not all high D-dimers uh, mean PE or DVT. So whenever your D-dimer is high, there are multiple different things that can be going on. It may be the patient fell down, they are obese, they um, they had something else going on uh, there was some other inflammation going on in the body so D-dimer can go up uh, at the wink of an eye for many many different reasons so a high D-dimer doesn't necessarily mean PE but a low D-dimer will rule out PE so just keep that in mind then troponins uh, may need to be drawn and they are usually normal and then the gold standard test for PE is CT angiogram so although it is a gold standard test but we don't always do it a gold standard test means that uh, with this test you can basically with 100 percent certainty say that this patient has pe so this is ct angiogram traditionally in order to make the diagnosis we just do spiral ct of the chest so a ct scan of the chest which is done in a special way and we call it spiral ct that is the regular test that we do to uh, look for pe but the gold standard is CT angiogram. And then VQ scans used to be done in the past. We are moving more and more away from these. Uh, they also can point to PE. What is the treatment? So whenever a patient has PE, they need to be first placed on heparin. So IV or subcutaneous heparin, um, usually IV heparin. And then uh, they need to be on warfarin or uh, coumadin, which is anticoagulation treatment. Uh, depending upon whatever was the cause of their PV, whether it was provoked or unprovoked, they either need to be on lifelong uh, Coumadin or they need to be on uh, some duration uh, of therapy. Usually once somebody has developed PE, it's a lifelong uh, treatment. If it's only DVT, then it doesn't have to be lifelong. So this is all about PE. Uh, let's talk. Let's look at the uh, EKG. So this is a typical S1, Q3, T3 pattern on EKG. Again, this is uh, uh, a very buzzword and whenever you see this, then you say, okay, this is a sign of PE, but usually the, this is uh, just to say that sinus tachycardia is the most common uh, finding on EKG. All right, so the next thing is, again, if you have um, acute duration uh, and, ons and usually sudden onset of shortness of breath and then also along with that now you have sudden onset of chest pain then you must think about pneumothorax as well so that's another acute condition causing shortness of breath whenever we see this oh i'm sorry whenever we have these things uh, sudden onset of chest pain and shortness of breath we must ask if the patient had uh, very severe chest pain in the beginning and then gradually got better um, but have ongoing shortness of breath and if the patient says yes and they give a very classic story then definitely think about pneumothorax because pneumothorax is uh, very common and this is how it presents um, now your pneumothorax patients are going to be relatively young patients or they can be somewhat older too but uh, they're going to be relatively young um, than your uh, coronary ischemia patients or your PE, even your PE patients uh, and there are risk factors for this too. So we'll talk about that in a second here. So what are the physical exam signs? So these patients will develop 
uh, of course tachypnea tachycardia and hypoxia so again if these are uh, causing hemodynamic instability which means that they have pretty bad tachycardia and maybe some hypertension and tachypnea so respiratory rate is really high and they are hypoxic uh, then definitely think about pneumothorax uh, they also uh, on lung exam have decreased air entry so uh, on the side of the pneumothorax so uh, uh, that is um, usually a hallmark of pneumothorax and when you percuss their lungs they usually have tympani so these two are the very special uh, physical exam findings for pneumothorax and just based upon this exam and history you can uh, make the diagnosis but of course we do the chest x-ray too to see what the extent of pneumothorax is and most people who have pneumothorax of more than 50% of one lung will develop very classic symptoms but there are some who have very small pneumothorax so if the lung uh, less than 10% of the lung is involved then usually they don't even have any symptoms so keep that in mind your patient may come in with very mild symptoms or very severe symptoms and then depending upon whatever the extent is after doing the chest x-ray we decide if uh, we need to intervene or observe or whatever so risk factors are uh, smoking is the biggest risk factors that is a risk factor that is something to keep in mind if a relatively young patient who is a smoker is definitely at risk for spontaneous pneumothorax um, then your trauma patients so that is usually your tension pneumothorax patients uh, they sustained an acute trauma and or develop pneumothorax or patients who have a history of emphysema they were also at risk for pneumothorax so pneumothorax can be either spontaneous or um, tension pneumothorax but the treatment is usually the same um, so if it's fairly big pneumothorax we have to uh, deflate the lung this is a, pa uh, a chest x-ray showing pneumothorax on the on the right and you can see uh, pretty much all the lung is involved this is all black um, this is all air and then the lung is basically collapsed and here is the pneumothorax on the left and you can see it's a small area um, so only a segment of the lobe is involved and it is a CT scan of the chest so this shows your pneumothorax on the on the right and a fairly large amount of uh, chest cavities involved and you can see lung is basically collapsed all right so the next one is basically a patient coming in with again shortness of breath after asking about duration and onset we look at uh, we can ask about chest pain if the chest pain is present so whenever these two things are present in addition to the previous diagnosis that we considered we must consider aortic dissection too so this is going to be your very uh, acute actually i would say hyper acute situation where patient comes in within a matter of a few hours so they don't even uh, have symptoms for uh, several hours or days uh, this is usually very acute they come in within two to three hours of onset of symptoms uh, with very significant shortness of breath and chest pain and this chest pain is usually uh, tearing chest pain it's very severe very sudden it's radiating to the back and that's when you suspect aortic dissection so what are the risk factors so what kind of patient will develop aortic dissection again this is not your regular walking talking uh, general population who develops aortic dissection usually these patients have some risk factors and uh, the biggest one is uncontrolled hypertension so patient has a uh, long standing uncontrolled hypertension and they finally dissect their aorta or they have a family history of uh, either marfan syndrome or they themselves have marfan syndrome or they have a history of syphilis because syphilis causes aortic aneurysm and then they can dissect so you can see that although marfan syndrome is usually a buzzword and people just uh, whenever they want to uh, ask about aortic dissection they ask about patients history of marfan syndrome but it's not always present you can see that in general population uncontrolled hypertension is much more common so that is why this is going to be your bigger category of um, aortic dissection so in the order of uh, more common to less common this is how the risk factors go so always suspect it whenever you are seeing uh, very high blood pressures uh, again at the time when the patient presents to you so this becomes very tricky because when they present to you with these symptoms the blood pressure is not necessarily high actually it may be very low because now they are developing hemodynamic in, uh, instability so this is a patient who's going to be in acute uh, life-threatening situation so this is going to be your red flag situation because they usually have hypotension tachycardia and tachypnea so 
when you look at their previous blood pressures uh, it was very high and all of a sudden it's very low and uh, they have these symptoms uh, sharp pain radiating the back and you say okay this might be aortic dissection so this is how you uh, at this point you start intervening and when if you do the rest of the exam you will see that their peripheral pulses are decreased obviously they have some differential blood pressure so difference between the two arms in the blood pressure and you may hear some murmur but whenever you recognize the situation uh, you uh, can go ahead and order a CT scan of the chest which will basically give you uh, the final diagnosis of aortic dissection we can also draw EKG and troponins uh, at the same time when we are waiting for the CT scan and they may or may not show some things uh, some findings for example EKG may show some STT changes if the aortic dissection is causing some coronary ischemia and our patient is uh, also uh, suffering from cardiac ischemia and th there may be some troponin leak so it may or may not be present but if these are present don't just assume your patient probably has MI uh, because these may just be present as a red herring you must definitely pay attention to the character and the history of chest pain uh, these red flag situations and then risk factors and the CT scan will give you the final answer so don't miss this diagnosis because it is a life-threatening situation this is a slide showing aortic dissection so you can see normal aorta and then there is dissection so you can see there is a false lumen that is developed uh, and that's how the blood kind of starts to traverse through here and again this aortic dissection the blood is entering um, in the lining of the aorta so this is how instead of going in the right direction it's going into the uh, false lumen and this is a CT scan showing some uh, aortic dissection right here so you can see a, a clear line showing dissection and then here another one showing axial uh, descending aorta uh, and then here's a coronal view and you can see um, a very linear aortic dissection so blood is passing through the false lumen in the aorta So the next one is, uh, again, if you have a patient coming in with shortness of breath and uh, you asked about chest pain and they said, sure, yeah, I have chest pain too. And they are saying that their chest pain is exertional and along with shortness of breath, uh, which is exertional too, they may or may not have syncope. So whenever you have short, uh, exertional shortness of breath and chest pain, in addition to thinking about myocardial ischemia, uh, you can start thinking about aortic stenosis and syncope is not always present because it's usually a late sign and whenever it is present it's an indication for uh, surgery or, or valve repair so just keep that in mind so in addition to thinking about mi you must think about aortic stenosis but again not everybody develops aortic stenosis this is going to be your high risk patient so what are the risk factors well we'll talk about that in a second here what kind of chest pain this is going to be again this is going to be your classic uh, substernal chest pain but instead of radiating to the shoulder or left arm it's radiating to the jaw and it's more like a pressure or squeeze like chest pain and this is um, sometimes accompanied by syncope uh, again another very common symptom is that they, these patients have fatigue so they have they just get very very tired very quickly because they have exertion intolerance and what kind of patients you should um, think that may have aortic stenosis well it, this will be your relatively older patients so uh, usually older men can develop aortic stenosis uh, but it can be present in female patients too then smoking is a major major risk factor if it is present you must think about it and then patients with history of congenital cuspid valve can develop aortic stenosis so so now you can see that this category is going to be relatively young so if you already have a history of congenital valve uh, because of based upon whatever an echo that you did at some point or somebody did it and you know this patient already has a bicuspid valve and now on top of that they are presenting with these symptoms then obviously you must think about aortic stenosis what are some of the signs so the signs are going to be differentiating here so your patient as opposed to a regular normal cardiovascular exam they may have an ejection systolic murmur radiating to the neck so in the aortic area they have ejection systolic murmur so very important thing to keep in mind and they may have an S4 because now they've developed uh, LVH because of stenosis and you'll see that their carotid pulse is very weak or slow rise the diagnostic test of choice would be an echocardiogram obviously and then EKG and chest x-ray can be done EKG will probably just show uh, LVH 
or left ventricular hypertrophy. Chest X-ray may show some aortic uh, uh, arch calcification. So you may just see some uh, arch there, but then it's not usually very significant. And troponins usually are normal, but they may there may be some leak. If the patient is presenting at that time and they have these combination of symptoms at the moment going on, which means that n now they are developing some coronary ischemia and because of that ischemia, myocardium is leaking some troponins, but usually it's not a sharp rise. So uh, echocardiogram here, now it's showing that this is the aorta, so you can see the aortic valve here is very stenotic and usually if it's uh, small enough where they, it has caused some syncope, then it's a sign for repair. And here you can see um, Doppler, so the Doppler showing the flow uh, and because the stenosis it's not very uh, smooth. So you can see the flow is very uh, reduced and next is your uh, uh, murmur. So uh, aortic stenosis murmur is usually in the aortic area and it's an ejection systolic murmur. So you will start right here. Uh, at the onset of as uh, uh, at the onset of systole, and the carotid pulse is going to be really really uh, weak. So here is the murmur. So you can see systolic murmur starting at the onset of systole. Okay, so this is a normal aortic valve and this is of course stenotic valve, so obviously we can easily tell. Alright, so this was all about aortic stenosis uh, and now next we move on to heart failure. So this patient uh, who comes in with heart failure, they usually just have a duration of symptoms, so it may be a few days or um, a, a few weeks depending upon how bad the heart failure is, but they don't usually have any chest pain necessarily, so all they come in with is shortness of breath. So if you are suspecting shortness of breath and there is no chest pain and you are thinking okay this patient may have heart failure because of some of the risk factors, uh, you can start asking these questions. So these are some of the other, some of the more high yield questions. Um, if you are suspecting heart failure you will ask about dyspnea, orthopnea and PND. So remember uh, dyspnea, so it's DOP, dyspnea, orthopnea and PND, these three things uh, are usually classic for heart failure or left ventricular failure and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, the difference between left and right so in addition to these three they also have decreased exercise tolerance so they again become very tired very easily and they have lower extremity swelling so which is usually a sign of right-sided failure so whenever your patient has uh, shortness of breath and uh, you are thinking that okay it could be um, cardiac shortness of breath so I'm going to try to see if this patient has heart failure. The key question would be if your shortness of breath is getting worse when you're laying down or not. So if the shortness of breath is worse with laying flat which means there is more accumulation uh, of fluid in the chest cavity then that means that it may be heart failure. So for example your patient with asthma not, do not necessarily have increased shortness of breath when they lay down or patients with anemia don't necessarily have increased shortness of breath when they lay flat. Uh, their shortness of breath is usually going to be equal but heart failure patients are going to see a remarkable increase in shortness of breath when they lay down. So that is why they uh, put extra pillows under their head, they sometimes sleep in their chairs and that's how they present. So on top of that they have uh, PND so which means that proximal nocturnal dyspnea. At night they get up and all of a sudden they have a lot of air hunger. So those three findings when present signify left ventricular failure. If they have swelling, lower extremity swelling or abdominal swelling present too, then right-sided failure is also involved. And again, these are not going to be your regular, normal, healthy young people. These are going to be patients with risk factors. So what are those? So it may be coronary artery disease, smoking, hypertension, diabetes, older age, valvular disease, many, many risk factors. And I'll talk more about that in much more detail in the next couple of slides so but these are the main risk factors and what are the physical exam findings so whenever there is heart failure usually it means the heart is enlarged so there may be dilatation and you will see some displaced uh, cardiac pulse uh, on the chest exam but you also can see or hear s3 uh, with tachycardia which means s3 gallop 
you may see that the pulse is very alternating strong and weak and so this finding is not always present but can be present on top of that and I, I didn't mention it here but these patients actually usually have hypotension at the time when they have developed a lot of heart failure so they start out with hypertension but by the time they develop these symptoms because there is so much fluid overload and a lack of circulation now they've developed hypotension so they cannot sustain their blood pressure because of lack of cardiac output uh, on lung exam you will hear crackles or uh, ronchi bilaterally so usually they are heard at the basis because that's where the fluid is accumulating there is some pulmonary edema then there is some lower extremity edema so we call it pitting edema because uh, it will pit when you do the exam uh, there may be some jugular venous distension there may be some ascites and there may be some hepatomegaly but these findings are usually late findings so you don't see them right away the first and the foremost findings are going to be your edema that is the biggest one and then some crackles so these two are usually present early on by the time the ejection fraction has fallen below uh, a certain number like 20 percent or so then you will start noticing these findings but usually uh, in the range of 30 to 40 percent or a little below 40 percent all you see is just edema and crackles um, so these are the physical exam findings and symptoms so remember these three classic dyspnea orthopnea and pnd and then some uh, fatigue and swelling when you have these present with uh, with presence of some risk factors then you must think about heart failure and the 